everyone! I am honestly overwhelmed by the feedback that you gave me to my first YouTube video about why do batteries catch fire on the example of the latest Hyundai Recall. Thank you so much for your interest, for your proactive feedback and letting me know that this kind of content is interesting for you. We had a thousand views in the first 24 hours and you're still watching it which is just so amazing for me and I hope you keep doing that. In this video I will answer 7 questions that you raised after watching the video from last week. We will talk about NFC tags, blockchain technologies, hacking a BMS, battery swapping and more. My name is Veronica Wright, I am a physicist and consultant for battery lifecycle management starting a side career as a YouTuber. I just want to use part of my time to share my knowledge with you and I really enjoy it. Now I've clustered your questions into three main parts. Battery safety, transparency across the battery value chain and recycling. Before we start with the questions, let me very briefly summarize what we discussed in the last video. Hyundai Motor Company recalled 82,000 electric vehicles due to a battery fire risk and they announced that they will replace these more than 20 million battery cells that were produced by LG Chem by new ones for $900 million. Well, for Hyundai, it is really hard to figure out the origin of these batteries fires. And we discussed that it involves a variety of different stakeholders, starting at the OEM, the battery integrator, the battery manufacturer, back to the separator manufacturer and raw material provider to understand the issue. There are information gaps between the stakeholders along the battery value chain. And we need to write each individual battery cells by Biography to make a battery's life transparent and avoid such expensive recalls in the future. But I recommend you to watch the whole video so you can really understand today's content. Let's start with the questions. Question number one. If there is a defective cell in the battery pack, why don't you just turn it off? Do we really have to replace and recall all of these cells? Two aspects here from my side. So first of all, how do we figure out that the cell is defective? So we have the Hyundai Kona, which consists of 294 pouch cells in the battery pack. The MEMS probably tracks voltages, currents and temperatures of some of these cells. But that's basically it. So how do you know that this is a bad cell? If we think back to the battery thermal runaway itself, once you can actually measure variations in these parameters, it's kind of too late, it already happened. Well, I know that there is R&D and startups out there that are working on algorithms to predict a thermal runaway initiated by an internal short due to lithium plating, solely from tracking the signals, voltage, temperature and current and applying some complex mathematics. To my knowledge, this is still in its infancy and it is not applied in large scale applications. But lots of hope for that. Now, let's assume we knew that one specific cell in the battery pack is faulty. Can we just turn it off without the need to replace all the cells in the vehicle? Well, to my knowledge, this is not a standard yet, but there are options out there. And this brings me to question number two, which perfectly matches the first question. I'd like to hear what's happening, if anything, with the development of antifuse to bypass cells, Fraunhofer, and those separators that were somehow supposed to push a shortest runaway cell apart. I'm really happy that we have Mr. Vincent Lawrence from Fraunhofer who can answer your question. The aim of the antifuse, if every cell, because it is at cell level, if every cell is equipped with an antifuse, we have demonstrated that the technology is capable of shorting and turning off every battery cell inside battery system, bringing it to zero volt in a very low amount of time, let's say in a comparable speed to the triggering of an airbag. I have learned that they have identified two main applications. You have the applications like uh, airborne applications. So uh, if you compare it to road vehicle applications, if in a road vehicle you have a defective battery cell and the vehicle stops, it's something that is not very nice for the passenger in the car. But if you have the same phenomenon in electric aircraft, you just can imagine what it means if the tour and engines stops. 
if you have a lot of battery cells connected in series, one cell fails, you need not only to turn it off, but also to bypass it to allow the current to flow continuously. The second application is actually in case of a crash of a vehicle. The fireman that will rescue the passenger need to have an access to the vehicle. But if it's a high voltage battery like 400 volts, 600 or 800 volt battery system, you don't know if there are any parts that are are now directly connected to the chassis of the vehicle. And if this would be the case after the crash, the fireman could get an electrocution and their life is in danger. So indeed, once you know that you don't want to have a specific cell in your circuit anymore, you can use this anti-fuse to bypass this cell, but still keep the pack working. This works specifically good for prismatic cells and bigger cylindrical cells because if they're rigid can, it is a little bit tricky with a single individual pouch cell, but it works for a couple of cells in a rigid frame. So Fraunhofer started their development in 2014, and let's hear about the current status. We have worked very closely with a big tier one that uh, was willing to use this technology. So the current status is we are actually open and looking for further partners interested in the anti fuse technology. The technology has been proven to reach the lifetime required in automotive applications and that we can manage the currents and the energies that are relevant in a full battery electric vehicle. For the specific case of Hyundai, where we think that we had spontaneous internal shorts while the car was parking, this anti-fuse would supposedly not be the right solution because you cannot really avoid the thermal runaway in the cell with this device. Still, if you would have known that this cell is faulty and you would have turned it a longer time ago, it would be probably less likely that this specific cell goes into a thermal runaway. But let's listen to Mr. Lorenz for another technology Fraunhofer is working on, which could help in the case of a spontaneous internal short. If there is an internal short of the cell, so not an external short provided by the antifuse, but an internal short inside the cell, maybe it is a better idea to use another technology on which we are working with a semiconductor company that consists in measuring the self-discharge rate of every battery cell inside an automotive battery system. And based on the comparison of the discharge rate, so this is the speed of the self-discharge of every cell, by comparing this in a statistical way, we can identify if there is any cell that has for example, growing dendrites of a metal, can be copper, can be lithium, that will short the separator. And before it is shorting the separator in a hard shortcut that provides afterwards a fire in the vehicle, you can detect early, so before it happens, that a cell is getting bad. But this would be a complement technology to the antifuse itself. The second part of your questions can be summarized into transparency along the battery value chain. In the last video, we discussed the need to write each individual's battery biography in order to avoid expensive recalls like the one by Hyundai. I argued that we need collaboration along the battery value chain and shared responsibilities, exchanging information and data at the right time across the battery value chain for more transparency, and improved standardization and defining the right regulations. I am really happy that in this video, we also get some insight from Peter Patrick, who is CEO and co-founder of Circonomics. I think it's crucial to collect data throughout the life cycle of, of the battery. And I think the, the key issue here is, well, first of all, making the decision which data is actually important to have, because of course you can record all the data and can send it into a cloud environment, but a small anecdote here, when we first started with Circonomics, we wanted to find out how can we get data out of the battery management systems of different OEMs. And one of the first cars that we have hacked was the uh, Hyundai Ioniq. And we were just recording all the data that the VMS would give us within the first half an hour. And we have collected roughly five gigabytes of data just in 30 minutes. So that gives you a picture of how much data you could potentially get out of the car 
However, it makes absolutely no sense to have all the data available. Question number three. Can we integrate NFC tags to track batteries over lifespan? Actually, it's done already because this is the norm. This is the standard in at least the automotive sector. You have a component tracking, which is mandatory no matter where the car is put on the market in order to follow up breakdowns of cars um, centrally. In Germany or in Europe, for example, there's the VDA norm specifically dealing with RFID tracking of the component. And it's the number 5510 if you want to look it up. So we do have RFID transponders placed on the most important components and the battery certainly is the most important one nowadays. Question number four. Battery biography sounds like material certification and traceability, manufacturing data records which could morph into dynamic QR codes. QR codes or optical Optical product tracking components, um, they were the predecessors of RFID transponders. They're a little outdated um, if you look at larger components. However, if you want to follow up on smaller parts like individual cells, certainly QR codes might be suitable for that. Many cell producers uh, do already work with QR codes. This is what the EU Commission says about which information will end users and economic operators receive on the batteries they acquire or hold. Batteries have to be labeled with the information necessary for the identification of batteries and their main characteristics. Lifetime, charging capacity, requirement on separate collection, presence of hazardous substances and safety risks. This should be provided through appropriate labels such as a QR code. There was a really interesting question about who should actually write the battery biography. Should it be a decentralized solution such as a blockchain? Yeah, there are a lot of um, experiments deployed on the market, both on, on large scale projects coming from the European Union, for example. There's some um, experimentation taking place in the US. You see Avalanche together with Ford running a, a pilot on following up on the battery life cycle. If you look at the probably most developed or furthest developed product tracking concept, you have to look at China, where you have a centralized surveillance system on batteries running since quite some time already. I got a really interesting feedback, which is, I like the idea of a battery biography, but how might this affect the model of recharging where drivers pull it to a fuel station and swap their empty batteries for fresh new ones? This would, I guess, make traceability harder. I will give a short answer to this question, but I'm really hoping that I find a field expert that wants to discuss this with me. So for me personally, I believe that the concept of battery swapping is one more reason why we need to track batteries along their life cycle. If a battery was swapped for my car, I wanted to have a battery with the similar performance and quality than the one I had before, right? And this has to work over and over again. I want to have the same driving distance that I had before, so also the same capacity and power, which is actually largely affected by the driver that had this battery before. So essentially how another person used their vehicle. So for me, there are some really interesting and open questions to answer. How do we ensure that a swap battery has the same performance, driving distance, lifetime of the battery we had before? Do we have to ensure that? What happens with the batteries that reached end of life? And which data do we need to track for each individual battery to define the swapping process and the underlying business model? There were a couple of questions about battery disposal, recycling and circular economy in general. What is a good suggestion on battery disposal? Do we need decentralized battery disposal centers to reduce long transportations across Europe? Let's hear a little bit about what Patrick Peter thinks about circular economy. I wasn't really satisfied in the way we treat e-waste because I see batteries or other e-waste components uh, rather as assets than being waste because they're, you know, they have an intrinsic value, the raw materials contained and so on and so forth. So that's my, my, my private passion about it. From a market opportunity side, I saw that it is utterly complicated for a whole ecosystem to collaborate. So it needs some external party to help 
major players along the way to do that. So what we enable the OEMs to do is that they can simulate their recycling quotas uh, based on their actual feedstock of cars that they have deployed to the market. What does that actually mean? Well, we do know the bill of materials and we do know when the cars will most probably will be coming back to the OEM. And based on that, we can help the OEM to plan ahead their recycled um, contents that can be fed back into their, their new products. And we can also help them to find the best recyclers to, to fulfill their recycling targets and also minimizing their carbon footprint. We do have quite um, a large uh, demand side network now. So speaking of recyclers and potential second life users, so from utilities, we have all that in place. What would be really, really interesting for us would be to have um, better contacts to cell producers. So if there's any cell producer out there, please reach out. Thank you for listening and I really want to thank Mr. Vincent Lawrence and Patrick Peter for their support and for their availability and openness on such a short notice. We couldn't cover all the details, but I hope you're satisfied with your answers. More to come soon. Don't forget to subscribe.